Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where some of our best friends aren't subscribed yet. Racism and violence are an unfortunate and common feature of American history. Usually, black communities received most of the prejudice and discrimination, but from time to time, other minorities became the target of white rage. Today, we are going to tell you the story of a Jewish man who was wrongly convicted of murder. Then, instead of finding freedom, he was kidnapped by a mob and executed. Judaism in America Jewish people were part of North American history from the very beginning of European colonization efforts. The first member of the Abrahamic faith to set foot in North America arrived in 1584. By 1776, there were 2,000 Jewish residents in what would soon become the United States. During the Revolutionary War, several of them joined the Continental Army. One prominent banker even helped finance the war effort. George Washington was grateful for their contribution. When the war ended, he said, May the children of the stock of Abraham, who dwell in the land, continue to merit and enjoy the goodwill of the other inhabitants, while everyone shall sit safely under his own vine and fig tree, and there shall be none to make him afraid. Despite Washington's friendly rhetoric, those of the Jewish faith were not able to participate in politics. The reason why is because many states had laws which did not allow non-Christians to hold political office. However, after the Bill of Rights was passed in 1791, these restrictions were removed. Jewish citizens of the United States began participating in public life, but they still couldn't escape prejudice. When the Civil War began in 1861, the Jewish community was split. About 7,000 fought for the Union, while 3,000 joined the Confederacy. But perhaps the greatest source of anti-Semitism in the war came from General Ulysses S. Grant. As Grant attempted to take the city of Vicksburg, Mississippi, he was also fighting corruption in the Union Army. Although war was raging, Textile mills in the northern states still depended on cotton from the south, so northern traders would bribe Union officers to help illegally transport cotton to the north. Some of the traders who tried to profit from the war were Jewish, most were not. Grant, however, became convinced that the corruption in his army was because of Jewish traders. On December 17, 1862, Grant issued General Order No. 11. It expelled all members of the Jewish faith from his military district. This included the states of Tennessee, Mississippi, and Kentucky. Jewish families in the states were, in some cases, given only two days to vacate the territory, and they had to leave on foot, taking only items which could be carried. As news of Grant's general order spread throughout the country, Jewish officers in the Union Army began resigning in protest. Eventually, Abraham Lincoln became aware of what was happening and rescinded General Grant's order. Despite his actions during the war, the Jewish community would vote for Ulysses Grant when he ran for president, and Grant would choose many of them to serve in his administration. As Jewish communities grew and prospered over the next several decades, prejudice against them also increased. It would eventually reach a violent climax in the state of Georgia. Early life. Leo Max Frank was born to Jewish parents in Quero, Texas on April 17, 1884. The family moved to Brooklyn when Leo was just a few months old. He went to New York City public schools while growing up. After graduating, he went to Cornell University and studied mechanical engineering. Leo finished college in 1906, then worked briefly as a draftsman, then a test engineer. In October 1907, he was asked by his uncle to travel to Atlanta. After arriving, Leo was asked to meet with a group of investors from the National Pencil Company. The meeting went well, and Leo was told that if he could endure a nine-month apprenticeship, then the job was his. He graciously accepted the offer. In August 1908, the apprenticeship ended, and Leo Frank became a full-fledged employee of the National Pencil Company. Just a month later, he was promoted to superintendent of the factory. While climbing the career ladder, Leo also began courting Lucille Selig. She was from an upper-middle-class family that had lived in Atlanta for several generations. In 1910, the two were married. Leo also did his part to help the Jewish community. 
In 1912, he was elected president of the Atlanta chapter of B'nai B'rith. It was a service organization that tried to improve the lives of Jewish people in the United States. It also fought against anti-Semitism. In addition to managing a factory and helping the community, Leo and his wife also participated in many leisurely pursuits. The couple frequently attended the opera, and they participated in another favorite activity of the upper class, which was playing bridge. In the early 1900s, Atlanta had the largest Jewish community in the southern United States. It was also quite prosperous. For Leo, wealth and status wouldn't be enough to spare his life. An Unfortunate Murder Mary Fagan was born on June 1, 1899 in Florence, Alabama. Her parents were poor farmers. To make matters worse, Mary's father died of measles a few months before she was born. Frances, Mary's mother, couldn't handle the farm on her own. She also wanted to be closer to family, so Frances took the children and relocated to Marietta, Georgia. A few years later, they moved again to a home just outside Atlanta. Frances bought a boarding home in 1907, but it didn't provide enough income to feed all the children, so Mary did her part to help. She left school at the age of 10 to work at a textile mill. In 1912, Frances remarried, but Mary kept working. She found a new job at the National Pencil Company in 1912. She spent her days operating a machine that put erasers into pencils. She worked 55 hours per week. Supply chain issues caused the company to reduce pencil production. As a result, Mary was laid off on April 21, 1913. Luckily, she still had one more payday coming. Around noon on April 26, she went to the factory to collect her pay. Nobody saw Mary leave the building and she never returned home. The next morning around 3 a.m., the night watchman, Newt Lee, arrived. He spent the evening walking through the building, but eventually he needed to use the bathroom. Newt went to the basement and relieved himself, but as he was leaving, he saw something in a dark corner in the back of the room. It was Mary Fagan's dead body. A cord was tied in a loop around her neck. Mary had clearly been strangled to death. Her clothes were also torn and bloody. The police arrived, and after speaking to Newt, they arrested him. It looked like he had moved the body, so they immediately suspected him. After additional questioning, they decided he was innocent and released him. Police questioned Leo Frank the next morning on April 27th. They decided he wasn't the culprit and let him go. Several other suspects were arrested, interrogated, then released. The murderer's identity remained unknown. Over the next two days, as news of Mary's murder appeared in newspapers, the public became enraged. They wanted justice, and the police were under pressure to deliver. After some additional consideration, authorities decided that Leo was a murderer after all. They arrested him on April 29th. There was very little evidence to prove that Leo killed Mary, but one of the state's witnesses claimed to know exactly how it happened. Jim Conley was a janitor at the factory. Police went to question Jim on May 1st, but when they arrived, he was busy washing bloodstains out of a shirt. So they arrested Jim and began interrogating him. After several conflicting statements, Jim Connolly said that he helped move Mary's body to the basement. Supposedly, she died in Frank's office. He then asked for Jim's help with moving the body. Trial and Commutation Based on Jim Connolly's claims, a grand jury indicted Leo Frank on May 23, 1913. Leo's lawyer claimed that Jim was the killer and he should be charged. Another grand jury assembled, heard the evidence, and decided that Jim was not the murderer after all. The prosecution wasn't sure how to win their case at first. Depending on the testimony of a black man in Georgia was a risky strategy. To increase their odds of success, the prosecution helped build their case by attacking Leo's character. Prosecutors accused him of sleeping with women who worked in the factory. Supposedly, he was trying to have relations with Mary when she was killed. The prosecution then called a series of witnesses and used them to assemble a timeline which proved that Leo Frank had to be the murderer. As the trial progressed, newspapers in Georgia covered the case in detail. Much of what was written about the proceedings wasn't true, but it enraged people. Each day of the trial, an angry mob marched outside the courthouse. They threatened violence if Leo wasn't found guilty of murder. 
On August 25, 1913, after only deliberating for four hours, the jury unanimously reached a verdict of guilty. Because of the potential for violence, Leo and his defense team were not allowed to be present in the courtroom when the verdict was read. Leo Frank was sentenced to die by hanging. His defense lawyer began to immediately appeal the decision. The process took two years to run its course, but was ultimately unsuccessful. The Georgia Supreme Court decided that the trial was fair and let the death sentence stand. The United States Supreme Court also refused to interfere. Governor John Slayton was asked to intervene on Leo's behalf. He created a commission and examined the evidence. After considering the details, Governor Slayton concluded that Leo might not be the murderer after all. On June 21, 1915, he wrote an order that commuted Leo Frank's sentence to life in prison. Governor Slayton wrote of this decision, All I ask is that the people of Georgia read my statement and consider calmly the reasons I have given for commuting Leo M. Frank's sentence. Feeling as I do about this case, I would be a murderer if I allowed that man to hang. I would rather be plowing in a field than to feel for the rest of my life that I had that man's blood on my hands. The public was not particularly understanding. A mob surrounded the governor's home and threatened to kill him. The National Guard had to provide protection from angry citizens. A few days after issuing the order, Governor Slayton's term expired. He and his wife immediately left the state of Georgia and it did not return for years. The angry mob that failed to kill the governor would soon direct its rage at Leo Frank. The Lynching The night before Leo's commuted sentence was announced, authorities moved him to Milledgeville State Penitentiary. Supposedly, the new prison would help ensure Leo's safety, but soon after arriving, another inmate slashed Leo's throat with a knife. Leo survived the assassination attempt, but it wasn't the only threat he faced. Thomas E. Watson was an influential writer and editor from Georgia. When he heard about Leo's sentence being commuted, Thomas openly called for a lynching. His call to action said, This country has nothing to fear from its rural communities. Lynch law is a good sign. It shows that a sense of justice lives among the people. In response, a group known as the Vigilance Committee decided to kidnap Leo Frank and enact justice. On the afternoon of August 16th, several cars left Marietta at the same time. They arrived at the prison around 10 p.m. that night. The men who emerged from the vehicles cut the prison's telephone wires, drained gas out of the police cars, handcuffed the warden, then took Leo and drove away. Leo was taken to a site about two miles outside of Marietta. It had already been prepared for him. A rope was tied to a tree and beneath the rope was a table. Around 7 a.m. the noose was placed over Frank's neck. Then the table was kicked away. He slowly strangled it to death while facing in the direction of Mary Fagan's home. A crowd arrived later that morning to see Leo's body. Several pictures were taken, which we can't show in this episode, but the images of Leo's corpse were used in postcards. People also took pieces of the rope used to hang him and they ripped his bloody clothes apart. The items were later sold to collectors. Leo's body was eventually returned to New York where he was buried. The Jewish population of Georgia was understandably concerned for their safety. Over the next few years, half of them would move away from the state. Leo was finally pardoned by the state of Georgia in 1986. The Board of Pardons and Paroles wrote in their decision, Without attempting to address the question of guilt or innocence, and in recognition of the state's failure to protect the person of Leo M. Frank and thereby preserve his opportunity for continued legal appeal of his conviction, and in recognition of the state's failure to bring his killers to justice, and as an effort to heal old wounds, the State Board of Pardons and Paroles, in compliance with its constitutional and statutory authority, hereby grants to Leo M. Frank a pardon. Historians who have examined the case mostly agree that Leo Frank was not the person who killed Mary Fagan. The actual murderer, by most accounts, was probably Jim Connolly. But the truth is that we will probably never know for sure who killed Mary. 
If you want to learn about more horrible events in Georgia's history, we suggest a previous episode called Bad Things Happened in Georgia. What do you think about this tragic miscarriage of justice? Could it happen again today? Let us know what you think in the comments below. If you learned something new from this episode, then please help our channel. Like this episode and any others that grab your attention, and subscribe if you haven't already. You wouldn't want to miss the chance to further destroy your faith in humanity, would you? Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.